just have it fixed turning. I think that's working now. Is that okay, bud? That's weird, isn't it? It's not exactly live, it's sort of slightly delayed live. Well, no, it will be. Well, it's got to have time to swim through the ether. Oh, I think, I think that's gone to the wrong group. I think that's gone to everyone. But I think it's working as well. <laughs> and it's seven o'clock. Okay. <laughs> so. Are you there, bud? Well, I think our sound, our sound should be good. Our video is the right way round. And we're live. And we've lost Bud. Well. <laughs> good evening, Two out of three. If you can hear us, please let us know because we've lost contact. Oh. Ah, are you there, Bud? Well, I think that's the sound of him going. Yes, it was. <laughs> is that, can you see if there's anyone there? There are people arriving saying hello. Ah. Hello from Philadelphia. Good evening. Brilliant. Hello, everyone. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us again. <coughs> the rumour is that we've got the technology basically fixed. Um, so <laughs> you should be able to hear me and Christabel. Christabel reading out the questions, if there are any. I'm going to be working on this same painting, which I haven't touched since last week um, but in between I'm going to work on in my sketchbook this is a big sketchbook and I'm doing uh, a, a color rough for an album to be called celestial songs so this is just splashing around and I'll be doing more splashing around until I'm working out exactly what I want to do but I, I kind of like the sky but I haven't really made up my mind what I'm going to do in the foreground yet. So that's going to be me playing with that. And the first thing I'm going to do is just give it some random shapes, as random as I can do, with a pale grey, which would be the equivalent of starlight falling on shapes. And then from there I might look to get, decide what they actually are, buildings, rocks, trees, whatever. So it's going to start with a bit more abstract shape over. And I'm going to paint it with a, quite a dark neutral grey. It's a number four. So it's, that's quite dark. How long does it take for you to finish a project, Roger? There isn't really a fixed time. Um, this bit of work, which I put on here, just playing around with it, the stars were boring to do, but I listened to his, his story. But the background, apart from the stars, probably took about 20 minutes, half an hour, and the foreground possibly even less, because I've stolen bits from other drawings and things. Um, so we've got 35 years here and 35 minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> and everything in between. I don't always do a colour rough, perhaps, you know, one painting in three or four or less, maybe one painting in ten, I'll do a colour rough. Roger, were you asked to come up with cover ideas for Yes's Tomato album? No. No. Um, there was probably the kindest thing that could be said is a silly misunderstanding between John and I over going for the one. And I guess we both kind of decided to go into different directions. But I'm glad when I was asked to get back involved with the band for drama. I also did classic, yes. 
retrospective that I was glad to work on drama. I, I particularly liked drama. But then again, I particularly liked um, Going for the One, the album I didn't work on. Could you talk a bit about your um, your doing the Budgie album cover? Album oh, covers. Okay, I don't really know what to say about that. <laughs> um, the aeroplane with the budgie with the seagull skull on it goes way back to my college days. I love the um, the aircraft. It's called Blackbird, and it was a uh, a spy plane really it, you know it was uh, it could travel at a phenomenal speed at a phenomenal height I think 3,000 miles an hour and I saw it I saw it at Farnborough Air Show and I thought it was just a fantastic shape and I made a model of it when I was at college and then when I found this seagull skull and I thought you know the shape of the back of the skull and the point behind the cockpit in the aeroplane had a very similar shape and scale. And I thought these two pieces belong together. So that's what I did. I um, cut the front end off the plane and I merged it with the skull. And it, I loved the model and it was around my studio for years until I left college and started doing album covers. And when Dave asked me to do the cover for Budgie, it was kind of like already there. So difficult, it was difficult for me to photograph. So I ended up doing a drawing of the model. But it started as a photograph from a found seagull skull I found on the mountains in Wales. I like the band, by the way. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Good. Do you have a plan for the San Francisco exhibit? Ah, I think last time we talked I said by now I would have. Um, <laughs> It's, everything is going well, um, but we don't have a final date yet. And I can't mention the venue until we have a final date. But that should be really almost any day. Now, you're not going to be here next week, are you? No, I'm afraid so I'm week not. week after. Let's, let's see. I'll, I'll work very hard. <laughs> down the studio yeah, yeah I'll um, work very hard to get the date and permission to name the venue I'm looking forward to it and it's going to be a joint show with Freya so I'm really looking forward to that too that's very exciting it is yeah what's Freya going to be bringing do you know <laughs> well she was very lucky last year she had an exhibition in Tokyo and two invitations to exhibit in joint shows in California in November with me. And <laughs> surprisingly, but she sold everything in the Tokyo show, so she had nothing left. Oh, wow, that's so incredible. She's doing is pretty much after that Tokyo show. But I have one painting here of hers that we can use. and So hers is definitely going to be much more mysterious. <laughs> I think with the way we've talked about it, it, it would be good fun to show not just her paintings, but the clothing as well. Mm. And we're trying to figure out how we can show some of the architecture. Fantastic. I might sit to do this, excuse me. <coughs> I've gone past the stage where I'm willing to sit on the floor.
right. So I'm painting highlights, but they're highlights from the stars, not from the sun, so they're not showing up very bright. And I'm half guessing you probably can't even see them. Can you see them? Just fine? Yeah, I'm just going to bring in a bit. What's your favourite painting other than Yes covers? <laughs> other than Yes covers. Mm -hmm. um, that's a hard call because it, my favourite painting now might be a totally different one in 10 minutes. I've said this before. And 10 days from now, it could be completely different. It just changes all the time. I usually, a, a good rule of thumb is that there is a kind of period after I finish a painting where the painting I've just finished is the favorite. Do you do rough outlines for all of your paintings? No, everyone works differently. I really didn't have any idea what I would do with this painting except for the sky and I had a notion that um, if there was music being made you would see the stars, spir the music spiralling into the galaxy with no real demarcation. So that was a kind of the, the most of the idea. So I painted the galaxies and then I'm waiting for inspiration for what's going to be the source of the music. I put a couple of spires in so it could end up being something church-like or a, a, um, a woodland grove with a, with a, with a fire. So. I'm at, at this point I'm very open it's it's definitely not settled where it's going to go what's your memory of working on the flights of Icarus project well the flights of Icarus project was a collection of work by very well by numerous artists many of whom we were publishing in another in another form and um, it was quite good fun because we had Donald write us a poem. <laughs> we, we put a few books out with poetry because it, they're essentially picture books. And our view was that it, it, by and large people weren't going to read the text. So we thought, why not? Why waste that opportunity? Um, so we... as it were, surreptitiously published a couple of poetry books. Donald's was surprisingly controversial. I never thought the poetry would be controversial, but it was. <laughs> he also wrote a poem on the inside of the um, Relaire cover. How did you come up with the idea for the Never Turn Your Back on a Friend painting? 
album cover. Mm. Well, the title of that was this, so um, I had no part to play in the title. And for me, it was an odd one because the notion is a complex social idea. And yet what I was doing was a landscape. So I did, um, yeah. I did play with that for a while, and in the end I thought, no, I'm just going to make an image and hope that it works, and yeah, tricky that. There was another one like that for Dave Greenslade, which was Bedside Manor to Extra. These <laughs> I didn't really ever get how those two titles worked with the music, and to a degree, it was it's kind of a random thing about how they work with the art as well. Would you ever do an exhibition in Philadelphia? Would I never do? Would I? Sorry, do another exhibition in Philadelphia? Yeah. <coughs> I love Philadelphia. Absolutely. Yeah. We are at what I'd have to call the most embryonic of stages about talking about a museum tour of America. So I have no idea if this will happen. Um, we're, we're still, as I say, it's at the earliest stage. I've been asked if it was organized, would I be willing? And I said, yes. <coughs> Where it would go, I'm not sure, but I'm I would say Philadelphia makes a lot of sense. And if Yes play there again, we will exhibit there with the band, I hope. And Yes most certainly will play there again. What was the last project you worked on for Yes? The last project I worked on for Yes is still being worked on. <laughs> and it's um, like the last one that was is now public knowledge, which was the quest. The quest was done in relative secrecy, and so is the new project. So, and I don't know even if it's intended for this year or 2023, because that too is very embryonic. So yeah, the last project I did with Yes was The Quest, which was a studio album. When I first met Yes, they did two in the year, and now they seem to do one in a decade. So <laughs> it was a wonderful opportunity to do The Quest. Is there a particular band or artist you'd love to work on that you haven't yet? Oh, many. Good Lord, many. Um, I don't know where to start with that. <laughs> I, I must admit, weirdly, I've always, always fancied the idea of um, working on a Wagner opera. That always seemed a wonderful opportunity. Where and I had terrific fun working on the Puccini opera. Um, but Wagner has more of the Gothic saga <laughs> about it. You know, it's, there is a Tolkien-esque po uh, possibility about them, which I, would be fun to work with. OK, so I've just splashed some paint on, and it has a sort of rock-like feel and I'm going to break that up a bit and then I'll move on to this other painting <laughs> can you talk about what album this is for Roger this the, album? the small painting yes it's the album when, when I was asked to work on it it was called Celestial Songs 
So I guess that's a question from somebody who wasn't there from the beginning. It's <laughs> a recap. Oh, a recap, okay. Do you have an update on your art book? Well, it's been delayed, and I can't really blame COVID, but it has been delayed. And uh, I finished the um, layouts, I think, a couple of days ago in another context. Did I show the layouts of the book? Last week. Did I? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, Roughly, the book has been laid out, and we've got to just finally finish all the scans, put the text together, and get it out. And I would be thrilled if we can do that this year. That is a bit of a big ask, but it's what I will try to do. It looks, I'm painting pretty much black on black, so I don't really know if you can see that. Yeah. Okay. What color are you using for the lighter black? It's a neutral gray number four. A quite dark neutral grey. Normally, if I was doing a painting rather than a quick colour sketch, I'd mix the grey. I wouldn't just take it out of the tube. But as it's a rough sketch, yeah, that works. Is that because if you take the paint straight out of the tube, it's not particularly nuanced? That's true. It's it's really flat, especially in a paint colour, it can be very flat, mm. yeah. What did you make of John Anderson's o Elias of Sun Hillo cover artwork? What, what, what? John Anderson's... Yes, oh yes, sorry, Elias of Sun Hillo. Um, um, and the question was, what do I make of it? Yeah. Hmm. Well... John and I have had some interesting conversations about that. Um, David, who did the painting, I thought he did a very good job of it. So I think John was lucky in getting him to do it. But when I said to John, why didn't you ask me to do that? Because it's based on a story that was written by my brother. And John said I tried. And I kept having the phone hung up on me. Not by me, I, I might think. <laughs> oh dear. Who, who, whoever was in my studio at the time. So, yeah. Not everything goes according to plan. <laughs> I quite like that story because they often tell you as a, as a struggling artist or creative that if you get no response it doesn't necessarily mean the person it's a no it just means you need to ask again and you think oh sure sure you know of course it's a no if it's no response but actually <laughs> sometimes it's not a no sometimes it's not a no yeah there's a great um i ching phrase which is perseverance furthers i, I would say probably yeah <laughs> Artists I know now who ended up being successful or who I knew in that very early career, that would really apply. You know, there were some great artists I knew and some artists who were good, but the ones that eventually became successful were often the ones who just kept at it the, the longest and they were the most determined, mm. not necessarily the best. Mm. Do you have a favourite painting technique? <laughs> I, I, 
I, I like all paints for different reasons. I, I like the flexibility of acrylic, and especially large. It's just wonderful fun. But watercolor has an appeal for me. It, it's, it's very difficult. It's a very ch challenging technique, watercolor. But nevertheless, it can be very beautiful and a lot of fun. So, yeah. One of the things that's astonishing is that watercolors are typically what very young children are given to use when they want to paint. Possibly because they're non-toxic, although that's not entirely true. Some are toxic. But it's one of the least intuitive ways of creating art that I know, watercolour. You have to learn it. You, you, you really do have to learn it. Hmm. Okay, I've made a pile of rocks. <laughs> uh, probably not what I intended to do, so I'm going to break it up a little with some foliage. If you were asked to, would you agree to appear on Desert Island Discs? The question was? If you were asked to, would you do it? Would I appear on Desert Island Discs? Yes. I don't know if this is a, a Radio 4 uh, professional yeah, here or yeah, just yeah. someone curious. I'm just wondering, you know, um, is there a political reason why not? I can't think of one. Yeah, why not? Yeah. I haven't been asked. <laughs> well, there we go. Good. Hint, hint. Yeah. <laughs> if you've got any connections, Roger would say yes. There you go. Do you have a portrait of yourself and Freya in the same painting? In the same painting? Yeah. No. No. That would be nice. It would. <laughs> first portrait I had that I remember made by another artist was Jeff Jones who was sketch of me when we went down to, um, I think it was done when we went down to Tim Tadgel. He was researching an Arthurian book, oh, cool. an illustrated book. And yeah, we went down there. That would have been good, good fun. Uh, Jeff got ill and that book never happened but yeah that, that was a shame Oh, we've even got a compliment on how good our sound is. You're welcome, Andrew. <laughs> we really tried hard. Roger's been practicing all week. On what? On the sound. Oh, my God, yes. Well, yes. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the problem we because we won't sound very smart. <laughs> I'm, I'm relieved that it works and we can talk and you be and be heard yeah just take the compliment thank you <laughs> has oriental style artwork influenced your style of painting uh, the, the answer really has to be yes especially because uh, you know um, at 
almost anybody's most receptive period in their lives is their early teens, 12, 13, 14. And I was in Hong Kong in those years. So I was looking at Japanese, not Japanese, Chinese um, watercolor paintings, not often in their original, although occasionally, but everywhere in terms of scrolls and reproductions and stuff like that. And I loved it. I just thought it was so beautiful. So yes, it had to be an influence. Um, Japanese art too, magnificent. I love the woodblocks. And I particularly like some of the more modern ones from the early 20th century. They're amazing. So yes, I would say, simply said, yes, it was an influence. There's other aspects of Chinese and Japanese art that is fascinating because we paint in this sort of way as a hand-eye coordination thing. You look at something, you reproduce it. Um, if, if I was working as a Chinese artist and I was painting that scene with rocks and the trees, they wouldn't so much observe, but they would write them. So there, the Chinese watercolor technique is very much a, a calligraphy technique rather than a hand-eye coordination with a lot of observation going into it. It's, it's especially if you see Chinese artists painting bamboo, it's a couple of flicks and a couple more flicks for the leaves and hey presto, it's done. But that training of the hand to do the calligraphy for that gracefully is serious business. And for me, that's interesting. I, I like that combination of drawing with calligraphy and writing, if you like, as a, as a careful drawing and painting. Rick Griffin was a master of switching those two roles. He painted like a calligrapher and he did lettering like an, a painter. So yeah, and that's th that the idea of art being done as a graceful movement of the hand, the fingers, the wrist, the elbow, the body. Yes, it has a lot of appeal and I, I think it is something we should embrace. It's, don't treat it as not for us, it's definitely something for us. It all is. The, the thing we really have to focus on is craftsmanship and skill where it comes from it can be another area to explore but you have to go for the skill in the craftsmanship okay am i sounding off too much and now i'm thinking of <laughs> where to go with this <laughs> well that would feed into the next question which is how do you know when it's time to stop oh And I have to eat. <laughs> um, I think you build a relationship with a painting and it certainly says stop, but sometimes it says it too quietly and you go on too long. But yeah, yeah. Yes. It's not just when to stop but it's also when to leave space. I mean, this is a joke, it, but it was, it was really said. A journalist was talking to me, and this is back in the 70s, and they said, oh, I love the sense of space you get in your paintings. How do you achieve that? And I said, well, deadlines. I never have time to fill them up. And as I say, it was a joke. But there is some truth in that, you know, it, working under pressure, is a discipline that's interesting because you do develop a lot of skills and making radical decisions about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do is important. What is going to be left dark? What is going to be left unsaid? What is going to be hinted at is as important as what you spell out. There's a lovely phrase in Japan and I don't really know all the intricacies of its meaning but it's mu, 
and it's about the space between the things. So it, whether you're designing a building, it has a relevance. If you're in a conversation, there's a relevance. It's the importance of that gap, that silence. Uh, I read a script by Hank, who's a friend of mine, who was the publisher of Tetris, and he was saying that um, he missed the gap on the CD when he was listening to one of the Beatles albums because the music came to a point where there was a pause at the end of side one, you turned it over and started again on side two and there was a meaningful gap but in on the CD the gap no longer exists. They have edited the music as a continuous piece and he thought that was wrong. It missed the significant pause. So, yes, I don't think about that, but I try and understand it so it intu intuitively gets its headspace in my work. I'm talking to avoid having to make a decision about whether I should leave it now and move on. Well, we've got sort of 10 minutes if you do want to look oh, at the okay. well, I haven't big worked one. On this at all, have I? I'm going to work on this a little bit more. What advice would you give to elementary art students? We've got a teacher here of art, so advice for them and their students. What is the advice I would give to what the students or the teachers? I think elementary advice for students just starting out. Well, I'm not quite sure I understand that because it could mean elementary students, uh, i.e. young, very young kids. And I did once talk to a group of teach uh, teachers of very young kids. Excuse me a minute. And um, they were concerned about how to get children to concentrate on art. And I said, read to them read them a great story and they will just not stop they will work until you stop reading <laughs> I mean it's what happens to me if I'm listening to a great story I can just carry on indefinitely mm. um, so that's the advice I would give to very young kids or the teachers of very young kids read to them teach them a little read to them a lot <laughs> But if I was talking to art students and they said, what tips would you give? I'd say the best key to developing the skill is to put in the time. If you want to play guitar, like Eric Clapton or anyone else, Steve Howe, Steve Hackett, there's only one way, and that's to keep at it and keep at it. And they don't do it as a chore. They do it because they love it, and they just want to keep at it. So you have to enjoy it. You, you can't make it a chore, or that will kill it for you. So that's the trick. Keep working at it, keep working at it. Um, there's an old saying that it takes 10,000 hours to train a concert pianist. Well, the same would be true of an artist. You, you've got to put in the time. 10,000 hours sounds ludicrous, but it's only a few years, you know, the period mm -hmm. of time you're at art school, really. But on a shorter time scale, and I've said this many times as well, you go into art school typically from a secondary school of some kind where you're drawing or painting in 90 minute or 45 minute chunks and if you can break out of that because art school is also broken up into sessions and periods but if you can break out of that and spend 10 or 15 hours on a drawing you will make a terrific difference to what you can do it you need to put in that kind of chunk of time and if you do it a few times your abilities would take major leaps. So it's down to time. Time 
in terms of that day-to-day -day putting in the effort and time in terms of accruing the hours over the years. And presumably to some extent doing the right thing ten, for 10,000 hours rather than practicing something that never gets any better or practicing something wrong. Or maybe that's not really the case in art. Maybe you can't practice wrong as the, the way you could in um, in kendo. You could practice the same cut a thousand times, but if your form was off, you'd be training the wrong movement. Y yes, but it doesn't matter. It, it's important to get it right, but the training is even more important because you're building all kinds of other things. But yeah, you've, you're building muscle memory. But I, I know... People have all kinds of ways. I mean, I can paint, you know, that little tree up there. I was painting it like that, but I can paint looser like this. And the same applies to drawing. There's lots of different ways. But I do know people who hold pencils and pens increasingly weird and exotic ways. I'm one of them. Basic calligraphy is never taught at school these days. So you miss that, and it's a shame because it's important. Um, it's very much easier to teach Japanese children to draw, not because they're better at it, but because they have this parallel discipline of calligraphy. Mm. Um, in England, art schools pretty much don't teach art, let alone calligraphy. It, it would be a good thing to do. Mm. You'll have to teach me. Apparently, I hold a pen terribly. You do? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know it, at least. Well, according to my uh, primary school teacher, who met me several years later and was shocked <laughs> at, at, at my <laughs> writing. <laughs> well, why didn't they tell you? <laughs> well, it it's wrong. a good why question, isn't it? Do it right? Exactly. Yeah, indeed. Did you learn how to hold a brush properly in art school or no. before? No. No, unfortunately, no. And I wish I did, but I didn't. So it was um, a managing doing it wrong. So what does that say? It says, yeah, you can do it wrong and still function. Mm. We very nearly had a cat appearance then. Sorry? We nearly had a cat appearance, but she's gone the other way. Oh, OK. I, I guess the thing that you need to learn in kendo, assuming that your form has some basic correctness about it, but the most common error in terms of how often we've been shouted at doing kendo has been about being too tense in the shoulders. It's all about relaxing and, you know, the form stands a much better chance of being correct. If you're loose around the shoulders, the elbow and the wrist, but especially the shoulders. And I, I, I guess for the first 20 years, people get that wrong. <laughs> so I've started to introduce an alternative light source in here. And I still haven't made up my mind if there's going to be a building or whatever coming from there. But somehow in here, there is going to be people making music. And that music is going to be escaping into the night sky. Um, and I'll play with this for another hour or so. And then I'll think that in terms of the basic subject matter, I've got that right. And I might then spend a lot of time drawing, sketching out little ideas for this foreground. It's just lumped at the moment. I didn't really think it through at all. But now I will. <laughs> so, and I never got round to this today. So between now and next <laughs> time I see you, I will figure it out. Ah, OK. Those lumps should probably, probably be X, Y, Z. And I'll work out what X, Y, Z is. Okay. Great. I, I, I'm, we're planning to finish today.
now <laughs> at 7.45. So the idea was to go from 7 o'clock to 7.45. So instead of just finishing Stone Cold Dead, I will say any last questions. Any last questions? We did have one just before then, which uh, was... Um, I wish I'd not been so timid to try new things. Have you ever felt that? Yes. <laughs> Sadly, too often. Yes, yes. But still, it's not too late, you know, try new things. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's been an honour. <laughs> and I'm dead impressed that um, apparently you can still hear us both. <laughs> so that's been wonderful. Well, um, that's our genius. We're going to get that. Yes, so, of course. <laughs> Christabel and you. A pair of you. <laughs> um, yeah. We won't see you next Tuesday, but we'll see you the Tuesday after, if you're interested. We'll be here 7 to 45 minutes Tuesday week. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everyone.